Well, hello everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining me for this talk, Building an Artificial Brain. Um, one of the things that I tend to do a lot of, I, don't, I used to be an engineer and do real engineering, and now I just talk about it a lot. Um, so to keep my hand in, I tend to do a lot of hobby projects. Is this a bit loud? Or seems to be echoing around for a bit. Um, so I've always got multiple projects on the go, and I'm really bad for being halfway through a project and then something else catches my attention, and it's, ooh, shiny, flashing lights. So one of the things, I don't know if you've seen this before, on, if you go to YouTube and look up Pipe Dreams, Annie Music, this is gorgeous. It's an animation um, where you can see some of the balls flying through the air, these air tubes throwing balls in the air, the, the balls are hitting various instruments. And the first time I saw that, I thought, that is incredible. Just as an animation, it's incredible. Um, and I, I sort of vaguely thought it'd be nice to build something like that, and I thought, there's no way. And then Intel built one. And this was actually at the Embedded Systems Conference several years ago, and it turned out to be the one year I didn't go. So I never got to see it in the flesh, but I really, really want to build one of these. And there's a guy in the office uh, who is interested in building one also. We'll get to the smaller desktop model, but have the balls flying around. Lots of LEDs. When the balls land, the LEDs will flash and everything. So that's a background project, but he refuses to start work on that until I finish some of the other things in the office. He wants a clear desk. So I'm chomping at the bit to do this, still working on my other projects, and then I ran across this. And this is called the Big Hex Machine, built by the students and lecturers at uh, Bristol University. And it's uh, little four-bit modules that are all plugged together to make a 16-bit computer. And when I saw it, I thought, ooh, shiny. And I actually talked to my friend Dwayne Benson about this, and we started working out how we could make our own modules and everything. I was still thinking about that. We, had, we did quite a bit of design work on it, just because it looked interesting. And then I ran into this one. Um, this is built by, I, I did actually ask this guy, because he built it in his front room, he's now given it to a, a, univer, a, a computer centre. And I said to him, what did your wife think about this? Uh, and he said, I'm a classic case of, you know, the neighbours said he was so quiet, no one would have thought. <laughs> he doesn't have a wife, but he does have a very big computer. Uh, and I thought, you know, 4, uh, 42,000 transistors all hand-soldered, and I thought, ooh, shiny. <laughs> and I switched my attention to that one. And then I ran across this guy. Uh, he builds himself as a technologic artist, and he built this thing called The Clock. And it's built out of diodes, resistors, capacitors, all individual components, no circuit boards, uh, all air-wired or fly-wired, whatever you want to call it, together. Um, and, and it's digital. And I thought, oh, that's quite, quite clever. And then he recreated it as a tower. It's called the tower, and it's again a clock, all digital. Now he's replaced the thousands of L uh, diodes with LEDs. So the whole thing's flashing away. And this is where my nerve broke. I thought, I've got to have something like that. In the office, a tower of lights flashing, but there's no point in doing something that somebody else has done. He's already got the clock market tied down for this flying away and wires and everything, so I thought, I've got to come up with something else. I love the glass cylinder thing, so the first thing I realised that was very important to do was to find a house for whatever it was I was going to build. Uh, this also, in addition to giving me something to do, it also stopped me having to think about what I was actually going to build and how I was going to do it. Um, and eventually I found something on eBay, this nice glass cylinder, and I also found something else at the pottery, the pottery barn, the more curvaceous one. Uh, and I thought, right, this is going to be the home of the brain. I'm going to create a, a sort of neural network. Lots of LEDs flashing away, doing interesting things. So, the very early days, I was like, I'm definitely going to have some sort of audio input. So there'll be a microphone, it'll be taking sound, and because one of my previous projects was this uh, Victorian steampunk spectrum analyzer, um, so you play music and it's a big, it looks grassy and lots of bolts everywhere and a matrix of tricolored LEDs. But it was based on this uh, little chip called an MSG uh, EQ7. Uh, very tasty little chip. 
you feed an audio stream in one end, it just clocks away packaging everything up into seven different frequency buckets and you just read those out as an analog level, you just keep on pulsing the output and read all the values out and you can use them to do anything you want. So I thought I'll probably use something like this. The, the, the circuit on the right is just the internals of the chip. Uh, and then this was sort of the very vague early days. I was thinking uh, I'll have a microphone, I'll have the MSG Q7, I'll feed into an Arduino. Um, I was thinking I'd have all these cells all the way up. And I was thinking the cells would be pre-programmed with whatever, however they were going to function, it would be pre already preloaded into the cells. But what I could do was use the I2C bus to upload uh, coefficients. So I could tweak, so they'd all be parameterized, and I could, all I could do is upload new parameters to all the cells to, to vaguely change how it was going to function. So the next step was to think, how am I going to put these cells into the, arrange the cells in the cylinder? And this was a very first pass. I sort of thought, well, if each cell occupies a cubic space, then this is sort of the layout I could achieve, which didn't seem very interesting. So then I, I went for something that was more vaguely, less cubic, uh, and you, you have a central core and then a middle ring and then an outer ring, and maybe rotating the center a little bit to make it more interesting. And then I thought, well, we're going to have multiple layers going up the tower. And I could just simply stack the layers on top of each other, or I could rotate each layer by a few degrees as we go around to give it more interest. And at this stage, I was still sort of vaguely thinking of it a bit like a spectrum analyzer. Sounds coming in, you've got different heights of coming up you know, based on different frequencies. Yeah, I, I was still, you know, it's like, it looks really nice on the uh, big display. So I thought, well, it'll look nice in this. Uh, I've moved away from that scheme now. And then I started thinking, uh, again, this is, I'm, all I'm doing is throwing the ideas out as I was thinking about them. So I need some way of describing things in this 3D space, uh, whether signals are going clockwise or anticlockwise, which I call widdershins, which is an antique word for anticlockwise. Um, up or down and I was thinking what words do you use to talk about coming out from the central core or going into the central core and uh, I've not really come up with those yet so I'm still thinking about that and then I thought what are we going to do for the cells so each cell is going to have some sort of or each neuron I call them neurons is going to have some sort of processing element and again this is a very vague first pass idea I was thinking that Definitely each neuron is going to have a tricolored LED so that we can see what this neuron is thinking at this time. Since I, this time I was thinking of a vaguely cubic space for the cell, I was thinking we'd have six inputs, one coming in from the bottom, one coming in from the top, uh, two coming in from the sides, and or, well, four sides of the cube. Uh, and then one idea would be to have one output coming out that feeds the surrounding cells. The next idea would be to have six outputs coming out. You've got to remember, this is all going to be hand-soldered, floating in air. So when you say, oh, we'll, we'll make this one wire into six wires, and then you have thousands of neurons, you're just increasing the amount of time one of us is going to spend at the kitchen table for the next two years. Um, and then I was thinking, um, I was, well, sorry, go back. Uh, do I do these as analog units? I mean, should this, the inputs be analog levels, uh, basing it on an op-amp, for example? And I quickly discarded that idea because I know that much about analog <laughs> compared to what I know about digital. And with digital, you can do so much more uh, processing and everything. The analog's sort of hard-coded into it. Whatever circuit you've got, that's how it's going to behave. One of the things I thought about was a process of self-discovery. So originally I was thinking about using the Arduino. Uh, I, I do a lot of projects with the Arduino Nano at the minute, so that would be great as a prototyping base. And then ultimately, when I come to build my own neurons, I build a little circuit board with the same processor as the Arduino. Uh, but for prototyping, you can get these things for $3 a piece now, so you know, it's not that expensive to throw a 100-node uh, device together. And I was thinking that there would be some sort of what am I 
process of self-discovery. When you first power the thing on, with the Arduino, you can use uh, impu uh, inputs with pull-up resistors on. So you could, you could program all the inputs to be pull-ups. For the first second when power supplied, each cell could pull all its outputs low. And that lets the other cells work out which inputs are connected to another cell and which inputs are not connected. Because if you're on the outside of the glass, facing the glass wall, you, you're only going to have signals coming from the neuron inside the cylinder, but you're not going to have them coming from the other side. So this way, a neuron could work out if it was on the bottom level, if it was on the top level, if it was inside the cylinder or on the outside face. So it would give it some sort of self-knowledge as to where it was in the 3D environment, which I thought might be handy. So that's when I started thinking about you know, moving things a step further. Uh, and in fact, I was ruminating on this as a background thing, and I talked to uh, Nathan over there, the guy in the Hawaiian shirt. Uh, Nathan works for Cy Lego, and we were just bound, well, he was, at, he was trying to tell me about a new component they've got, and I was trying to tell him about my artificial brain. <laughs> and so we, both, we had messages going backwards and forwards. Uh, and at the end of that, uh, Nathan went off happily, and about a week later he sent me an email going, you know, damn you Red Baron, I've not been able to sleep for a week. And he'd been programming his own neurons and getting them working, so that kicked me off into life again. Uh, so this is the next level that we went to. The, the li this is a top-down view of one layer of the brain. The little green rectangles, it's the edgewise view of a circuit board. Uh, the little mushrooms, that's a, an 8mm tricolored LED, because I like those big LEDs. And, and this was the vague arrangement, you'd have four, based on that, if the, if the circuit board is no more than one inch in diameter, then you can get four in the centre. And it seemed then to make sense, I could squeeze more in the middle there, but it makes sense to have eight in the middle there, because that's the, each one in the centre drives two in the next layer, each one in the next layer drives two in the next layer, and potentially we could keep on going in the future. Uh, if I can find somebody who will give me a much bigger glass cylinder for free. Because glass cylinders cost way more than you'd ever expect. So this was the sort of next level. They've got 16 LEDs in the outer layer, you've got 22.5 degrees between the outer LEDs and so forth. Oh, and uh, so for sensors, I'd now moved to the level, I've got one of the, well, I've got a couple of the Amazon Echoes, so it's quite nice as you're walking around talking, it, it knows which direction you're coming from. And so I thought, well, I'm going to have sound sensors, but not just that MSG chip now, I'm going to have eight sound sensors around the base. So it's going to have to be able to detect where the sound's coming from. And I'm going to have eight proximity sensors, the ultrasonic proximity sensors. So if you walk closer to it, it starts reacting. If you walk away, it reacts a different way. If you walk around, it knows what you're doing. And then I thought, what the hey, let's throw in you know, light, ambient light, uh, uh, pressure, temperature, anything. Let it react to the environment. So then, it, I've already said, should they be analog or digital? Uh, I've got a friend called Sri who works for Cypress Semiconductor. And he is constantly trying to drive me to use PSOC devices in my projects. Uh, if you're not familiar with a PSOC, it's programmable SOC. Uh, it, they come in different flavors. They've got, each one's got a processor in it. It could be an 8051, all the way up to an ARM, 32-bit ARM. Uh, they've also got programmable analog and programmable digital and a, a really great graphic user interface. You can just drab functions over and connect them together. Uh, so he threw this together with a 60 LED ring of lights. Uh, you can see that it's got six microphones on this one. And as you click your fingers as you walk around, it, it can detect which side the sound's coming from because it detects which microphone saw it first. And then it filters out the others and everything. So I thought, I might definitely use something like this in the base to accept the sound and work out where they're coming from and then feed stimulus into the brain. As I've said, I already thought, and again, I could do the same thing. I can take those, I can use their little development boards, breakout boards, but then in the future, I can create my own little circuit board and put the PSOC devices on those circuit boards for the neurons. We already talked about using the Arduino Nano on the left. I could use that as a prototyping base and then just build my own board with the Arduino Nano chip. 
Or on the right, this is the, uh, these are the chips that Lego do, they're called Green Packs or G-Packs. Um, this is a G-Pack 5, it's got 20 pins, it's in a package uh, 3 millimeters by 2 millimeters, which makes it great for what I'm doing, for these little neurons and everything. It's got very limited processing capability in the scheme of things. But it's not designed to be a brain. I mean, it's designed to be uh, like glue logic on a board. If you've got a lot of uh, analog chips and digital chips that are just doing little simple functions, you can gather them all together into this little, I think of it as a, mix, a tiny mixed signal FPGA. One thing it has got is a, an 8x8 asynchronous state machine. Uh, and you think asynchronous state machine, oh my god, let's not go there, but uh, it's designed so that it doesn't get race conditions or metastability. You just click the bubbles and set it up and it does what you want. And that's the equivalent of having a, an 8-bit microcontroller running about 100 lines of code. So that's, that's sort of quite powerful for what we're doing, in a way. So we sort of decided to go that way, and then we sort of started thinking, well, what connections can we have in the matrix? Uh, and this is the way we, where we moved to, where uh, each cell has got bidirectional connections, two wires. Uh, so not a, one bidirectional wire. So two wires to the ones on the left, two wires to the one on the right, two wires to the one inside, and for the one inside, two wires again, and so forth. And then in the center, there's no reason why we can't connect across that way as well. So from there, um, the signals on the, the, the we've got five volts, uh, zero volts, two I2C pins, three for the LED, but that doesn't come out to VIAs on the board because the LED is just mounted on the board. Um, with regard to the five volts, it, it seemed to make sense to have two five volts, one on either side of the board, because that's going to make it easy for me to decide how to wire into some power bus or whatever. And similarly for the two grounds, for the I2C pins, pins, we want to have the I2C ricocheting around from neuron to neuron. So again, four vias for the uh, I2C. Um, six inputs, six outputs. We've got 20 pins available. We're using 19 pins on the chip. Uh, and we've got 20 vias that we want to use on the board. And then rather than just having the vias, I'm, I'm working with a no 0.1 pitch matrix just because that's what I grew up with. I'm comfortable with 0.1 inch, so... Um, but rather than just having 20 pins all the way around, that's so easy to solder them the wrong way. And when you build this 3D matrix and you solder the wrong ones, you're going to be very upset with yourself. So I decided to group them into functional groups and have extra half vias, gaps to separate them. And I need 10 of those, which you, 10 half vias is obviously five true vias. Uh, so that gives me 25 vias, virtual vias, or 50 half vias, 360 degrees divided by 50 gives me 7.2 degrees between uh, half vias. Uh, and just using simple math, I can work out that the diameter of my board is going to be 0.9 inches, uh, and the working area in the center is going to be 0.7 inches, which is more than enough with surface mount components for everything. Oh, and the LED is going to be, like I said, a traditional 8mm package, but just mounted on pads on the front. All the other components will be mounted on the back of the board. Uh, so these are the connections now that we've got. You can see the power and ground on either side at the top, the I2C bus, two pins on either side. Uh, we've got one connection in the middle coming up from the bottom, one connection on the top going to the layer above, uh, and then two connections going bidirectionally on the left, two on the right, and then the ones at the bottom are the ones that are communicating with the neurons further into the cylinder or further out. It can get a bit tricky to wrap your brain around this, so uh, here's a top-down view. This is just showing the ones that are coming in from the inner layer and coming out to the outer layer. So then the next thing, we, we talked before about um, stacking layers on top of each other. Um, one thing to do would just be to, for every new layer, just stack it immediately vertically above the layer below. But that just means you're going to get a row of LEDs coming all the way up. So uh, you've got to understand that I don't think about these things in as much depth as I probably should do. This is mostly when I'm on the way to work and I'm vaguely thinking, yeah, it'd be nice to you know, rotate them a little bit. 
So I thought, okay, well, I'll rotate it by 11.25 degrees. So each layer is rotated by 11.25 degrees. So the outer layer now, you can see the, the pink of the layer zero, the blue are layer one. And as soon as I drew this diagram, I realized there was a problem <laughs> because the, the middle ring here, I've only moved one over. I've still got two more slots to fill. So I'm going to have to do four rotations just to fill this middle ring. And in fact, I've got to do eight rotations to fill all the center ones. So it's actually going to be eight rotations. And if I want a capping layer so that the top layer matches the bottom layer, uh, it's, it's like two times eight plus one. To, to, and again, I don't need a capping layer. I could stop anywhere I want, but aesthetically, I sort of think it would be nice. And then somebody else suggested, because uh, I did a blog about this, uh, why not rotate by three half connections? So instead of, the, so now the blue layer isn't rotated 11.25, it's rotated. And it, you don't rotate it 22 degrees because it would be over the layer below. You rotate it three and, and go around that way because now the, what ends up here is that the, this layer is just moved over one again, but this inner layer has moved over three. We've still got to do the same number total. And in fact, in this case, the way this works out, uh, if, you, if you work out as you're going around, so you're clocking around in groups of three, you get back to the beginning and now you go to the next one and you go around and you have to go around three times and ultimately you get 32 rotations before you're back where you started with one capping layer. And that's exactly the same as the first one. I said the first one needed only eight rotations, but that's because it's all to a power of two. So really, four times eight obviously is 32. So they both work out at the same sort of thing. It's just this one will make the inner layers look much more random. The, the very, the R0 circle, ring zero in the center, will just look more randomized. And then I thought, well, if I'm doing three, why not do five? But five is obviously just three coming back from the other direction, so there's absolutely no advantage whatsoever. So we now require, oh, so we now require, 30, this shows the, uh, the 33 rotations, 32 plus one. So we start off with the yellow. So if we rotate the next layer around, so this is the first yellow one. The next layer we rotate 33, 37 degrees around, so now we're here. The next yellow one, 37 again, and so these are the yellows. And when we come back to here, then the next one is the first green. So three ticks around, and then you do all the greens, and then you come around, this is the last green, and the next one is the blue, and you go around doing the blues. But, I don't know about you, but for me, I, I, I love doing this sort of stuff because it, I'm thinking about new things all the time. Yeah, this is not something that ever struck me as being of interest until I started doing this brain. And then I'm you know, sort of thinking about how it's going to look in 3D space eventually. The next thing is the power. How are we going to power this thing? Uh, one scheme would be to have fairly great big thick hairy power rails going up the center column and then have lighter rails coming off and then thin wires basically hanging the boards like on coat hangers in a closet. So that would be one way of doing it. Probably that would be too easy. Uh, so this is an alternative way of doing it. What I've done here is I've shown what this will look like if you're looking down on the top with multiple, multiple, multiple layers. Uh, so I'm thinking I'm going to run power rails, the red and green dots are the power rails going down throughout so wherever I am I can easily hook into uh, a power and ground and that this explains why on the circuit boards you've got power and ground on either side so on this one I can connect the left hand side to ground and the right hand side to power on this side I can connect the left hand side to power and the right hand side to ground so it actually makes a weird sort of sense it also means the power rails can be thinner but this, because there's a lot more of them, and I think it will give the whole structure some stability. I don't know if I'm ever going to move this. This might be one of those things that once you've built it, you don't touch it because you don't want anything to go wrong with it. But uh, it might find a home somewhere, certainly not in my house. My wife comes around and goes, ah, flashing lights, when is it going? <laughs> so my office looks like a, a palace of flashing lights at the minute. 
Fortunately, uh, I rent an office in a big building and I've got a 2,000 square foot bay outside the door that I, I'm free to use. So this table's set up with the most amazing things. So the next thing we came on to is that, yes, I could run out and start building the neuron circuit boards and I could start wiring the whole thing together and I'm going to feel really stupid if it doesn't work. So probably it's a good idea to create a prototype first and just prove the concept. Uh, and if we're going to buy, so to do that, we thought we'll create a circuit board. Because rather than hand wire all these things together as a prototype, it makes more sense to do it via circuit board because all the wiring is done for you. It makes it a lot easier. But if you're trying to make a circuit board that's nine inches in diameter, and as you'll see, this, this is a complicated circuit board because we're cutting most of the board material away. Otherwise, you won't be able to see through it, in which case it's not really serving a very useful purpose. Um, a nine inch diameter circuit board with all this material cut away is an expensive hobby. So we decided to do it in quadrants. If we can make a, a board that's a quarter of a circle in such a way that we can then plug them together to form a whole circle or a half circle or stack them and so on. Uh, and so going back to the original drawing, you see this is where the obvious quadrants lines will fall, the black lines, where you, you're cutting between the, this, the center ones that give you the, the point of, you know, this is where you've got to cut. So that gives us the quadrant boards and we, we put, originally I was thinking of using the same 8mm LEDs that we use for the other one and they're just positioned in the same places so you'll get an idea what this looks like in 3D space. It turned out that it's a lot more cost efficient if you're making a prototype to use surface mount LEDs. So but I just left them drawn as the round ones. So this is my Visio drawing idea of the early prototype. So the, the pink things are the LEDs, this is, the black things are the G-pack capacitors, resistors and so on. Um, we program it by connecting a USB dongle in and we can over, the, the, the chips are one time programmable. So by default we'll have them programmed so they perform the uh, whatever default neural activity we think they should do. But once again, once you've built this thing and you've got a thousand neurons all in 3D space and you decide to yourself, uh, I wish I'd done it differently. It's a bit late, so you really want the ability to reprogram it. Uh, and that's why we've got the USB. <clears throat> We're using, uh, with these GPAC chips, so you, you one time program them, but you can overwrite it using I2C because they've got SRAM cells as well. So whatever the default behavior is, you can change it to whatever you want. So when you power it up, it'll do one thing, but we can change it, which is very nice. Um, the problem with I2C is that by default you've only got 127 unique addresses. It's got one by a device address field, which would limit you to only 127 neurons, which isn't very many in the scheme of things. It's even worse with the GPACs because they actually only have a 4-bit I2C address field. So that means you've got 16 different neurons, which is not a brain by any stretch of the imagination. But it turns out the side Lego guys, the problem that you've got, I, I vaguely thought I could just broadcast the message out to all the neurons. I'd completely forgotten that uh, the I2C bus is bi-directional. The uh, data line is used to send and make knowledge back. And so that stumped me for quite a long time. And then the side Lego guys said, oh, well, we run, routinely program bunches of these things simultaneously. We just ignore the acknowledge. I was like, ah, brilliant. So we know for sure that we can actually, this is one quadrant, but the four quadrants plug together to make a layer. We know we can program everything in one layer at one time. So worst case, let's say I have 20 layers. I have to re-plug that device in, the dondling 20 times and reprogram each layer. I mean, that's not a killer. What would be a killer would be trying to reach your hand into the center to program individual nodes. And possibly we can do the whole brain in one time. Or in the central core, we could have some power transistors that we, we just switch layer by layer automatically. So we just make it a push button reprogram. And it might take a few seconds to work its way through the tree, but you know, anything that can be done automatically and saves me so I can go and have a cup of coffee and come back and it's working, I think it's a jolly good idea. 
So Nathan, this is the stage where Nathan and I said, okay, we could design the circuit board ourselves, but it would be really nice if it worked the first time. So Nathan said, ah, oh, we have two really great engineers who love to work through the night on this sort of thing outside of work hours. And these are the two engineers. You can actually see the uh, circuit board in the background. Um, so this is a 3D rendering of the board. This is as much as I've seen of it until today. Um, so what we've got here, these edge connectors here, remember that this node has got two signals that, well, this node's got two signals that talk to this node, and therefore it's got two signals that want to talk to this node on this side. Similarly, this node has got two signals that talk to that node, and it's got two that want to talk to the equivalent one on this side and the same for the center one. So we've got six signals here going backwards and forwards, plus power and ground makes eight, plus I2C. So the idea is when you plug this in and you reprogram through I2C, it, the I2C wraps all the way around. So we have a 10-way connector here. You've then got se these seven nodes can each talk to the seven nodes directly above them. And it means they can also receive a signal from the seven nodes directly below them. So these signals here, uh, these are through hole connectors, these are surface mount connectors, because the one on the top is isolated from the one on the bottom. The one on the bottom is bringing seven signals up from the layer below, plus plier and ground, plus I2C, and then the one on the top is sending seven signals up to the layer above, plus plier and ground, plus I2C. Um, if we go back to my original conception, you can see that the way I mounted the connectors was flush. And the idea there would be that when you mounted all things together, it would be per form a perfect circle. That had not been conveyed as well as it might have been to the engineers. And when I saw these 3D drawings, I was just like, ooh, shiny. And I completely didn't notice the fact that the connectors were sticking out, protruding from the board. Which is not a big problem in the scheme of things. It's only if you happen to be in possession of a, a glass cylinder that's got an internal diameter of 9 inches, or 9.9 .9 inches, 3 sixteenths, uh, and you've just pushed beyond that, that you have a problem. And no one I know has got one apart from me, and it's a prototype, so it really doesn't matter. It's just a, a superb illustration how you've got to really think about things. Don't just go shiny, build it. Go, hang on a minute. <laughs> uh, in reality, we wouldn't have changed it anyway because this was late in the game. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago to the day that we got the design files to Dwayne at Screaming Circuits. And two weeks to get this board built and populated and everything, uh, or fabricated and then populated, that's really not a long time. Uh, so the first time I actually saw the real physical circuit boards is today. Uh, and they are beautiful to behold, I think. Uh, so that was the top view, the little white spots in the middle of the LEDs. Uh, this is a bottom view showing the GPAC chips and the resistors and so on, and there's a voltage regulator. Um, oh, and this is now talking about the problem that this is the way I anticipated seeing it and this is the way it actually came out a bit spaced out but again it's still beautiful the way it is so this is Nathan um, this is the way he looked after a sleepless night trying to program his neuron and finally got the first neuron working of course, when you've only got one neuron, you don't quite know how it's going to behave. Um, Nathan got the final circuit boards on Monday uh, and programmed them. So this is his, his first pass neuron. Um, we'll be explaining this uh, further in articles and things. Nathan had gone a direction I'd never considered. What Nathan did is, is thinking, OK, we've got an LED. We're, we're not doing the full color ga gamut or anything. We're going to just use the basic eight colors if you count black as a color. So you've got red, green, and blue, red and green, green and blue, and so on. Um, 
Nathan decided that the way the neurons were going to communicate information was as a series of pulses. So one pulse meant red, two pulses meant green, three pulses meant blue, and so on. So the way this neuron works, this is the state machine, the asynchronous state machine in the middle. Nathan can support four inputs. Now, as you may remember from the previous circuit diagram, we put six on the board, but that's because we then said, well, there's lots of other schemes we can use. Let's put all the connections there, and then people can use which ones they want. The way this works, the, the machine is monitoring these four inputs. Whichever one sees a pulse first, the state machine immediately locks the other three out. So it's now just listening to the one that was talking, and it counts the pulses on that one. It uses those to drive its lead, and it uses them to retransmit the message out into the rest of the world to the other neurons. Potentially, you can have all the outputs doing something slightly different, or you can wire all the outputs to send the same signal and so forth. And, and this uses just about every resource that's available in the GPI-5. So Nathan was saying, well, there's not really any point in creating a pro The idea of doing the prototype, as well as building it ourselves, was also to be able to give other people the chance to play with it. And Nathan said, there's not much point in giving it to them. I've already done the best that can be done. There are no more resources left. You know, this is, this is it. And I said, well, that's funny, because I hadn't thought about doing it that way. I had thought about doing it uh, more level sensitive, where all of the inputs are either on or off. And depending on the number of inputs that are active, the node says, well, there's only one active, so I'm going to use this color. There's two active, I'm going to use this color. There's three active, I'm going to use this color. So it's all like level sensitive, which means you can support a lot more inputs. The reason Nathan's tied to using four inputs is that that's all he can count and block out and multiplex and everything. As soon as you go to level sensitive, you can use more inputs and a simple processing scheme. And that's when we said, well, in that case, you know, it is worth doing the prototype, because if we've come up with two schemes already, you know, open it out to the rest of the world, and people can come up with an outrageous number of schemes. Um, so at the minute, back to this, this is the way the prototype boards are worked, and I think this is the, I mean, when we come to build the final device, if we opt for a scheme that requires fewer inputs, maybe we'll cut down on these connections, because again, they're going to be hand-soldered by yours truly. On the other hand, I think I'm probably going to build it just like this, because that way, in the future, we can reprogram it to use different you know, input, uh, inputs and outputs and so forth. So we've got, in the prototype and in the final one, six potential inputs, six potential outputs. Uh, we don't know, the current one is pulse-based, but we could go level-based. Um, what we're going to do in a minute, we're going to actually have a raffle. We've, we've got... We call it a kit, so four neurons is one kit. You can pro connect them together like this to form a single layer, or you can, uh, well I'm not going to pull it apart at the minute, but you can have two half layers stacked on top of each other. Uh, you just have to you know, build the little connectors yourself vertically with wires and pins. Or you could have four quadrants stacked vertically. Um, this big board is the uh, development kit from Cy Lego. Uh, very affordable at $50, give or take, as it is. Uh, in the middle of it here, when you get the development kit, you also get something like uh, 50 of the GPAC devices. Remember, these are 3 millimeters by 2 millimeters, so not hand solderable. But this chip carrier here, you can pop it open, put the chip in, close it, um, and then you plug this into your, through the USB into your uh, PC. It's a graphical user interface, drag, drop, create that circuit, press the go button, download it. If you pull this out and plug that in, you can get these little breakout boards with the, uh, the chip. And you can program the breakout board. So that's what, that was the early prototype we were going to use. Now we've just got these chips mounted on those circuit boards. Uh, and this one is the same chip as that, or the same breakout board, but with a USB interface on the end. So what we're going to be giving away today uh, is a couple of these, well, we've got two kits. We were hoping to get 10, but two got built. Uh, we know that they don't work quite as planned. Uh, we end up with a message storm. 
So, so Na what Nathan's done, he's created a couple of these that uh, generate the stimulus that's required by the brain. So you've got three pins that are inputs that you use to level sensitive, so 000, 000, 001, 010 and so on. You've got a, a pulse, when you make it active, it generates a stream of pulses out, and that stream of pulses you feed into the input to the neurons. So we've got a kit that's got the four boards, it's got a couple of these to generate the stimulus, uh, and one or two of these. But whoever wins, we're going to like us have a raffle, whoever wins, uh, Nathan says he's going to send a complete kit as well uh, for you to play with. Uh, and what we'd like is whoever wins, uh, only enter if you think you're going to play with this and use it. But we, we want feedback, different ideas of creating the stimulus, different ideas of creating the neurons, and yeah, play around with it and have fun. Um, and, and, you know, maybe next year we'll actually have the full brain here to uh, show off. And then there's the fact that, you know, as we all know, two brains are better than one for every problem. Uh, you remember I said I'd picked up, I'd ordered this and then I found this in the pottery barn. And I sort of thought, well, if you're going to make one brain, why not make two? Uh, and one could be more of a male brain and one could be more of a female brain and they could have infrared communications between them. So if they get an external stimulus in the form of people talking or walking around, they respond to that. But if there's no external stimulus, they start talking amongst themselves via infrared, but then displaying what they're doing via the main light tree. So that that's sort of like a future direction we might take this in. So is anyone interested in, uh, in winning a kit? So I, I'm trying to imagine these now when we get some more done, I, you know, having multiple layers. I mean, you can absolutely see through that. that that's, that's come out surprisingly good. And the fact that you power it up and it works at all. So thank you so much for attending uh, this talk. Uh, I understand that from your point of view, this is just another one of my stupid hobby projects. But I'm learning a lot. The whole point about this is, first I'm going to learn a lot about using the GPAC chips. Uh, I, I'm, I'm now thinking about giving the nodes memory so it can actually be trained. Because I'm thinking that if we could train it so that it does a, I mean a simple form of speech recognition, where you can give it a keyword and it recognises my voice and it recognises that keyword and does something. I, it's an educational tool, that's the way I'm presenting <laughs> it. That's my story and I'm sticking to it.